Grace to you and peace, mercy, and joy from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our readings that always follow Easter Sunday always continue to give us reflection on the event of the resurrection. The Sundays that follow Christmas always give us a reflection on the reality of this one who has been born is indeed the Son of God. He is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, this one who came at Christmas died, rose, and he's alive. And our readings give us great depictions of the resurrection and the after events, as we have in the Gospel account, and as we have in Revelation chapter 5. Don't be afraid of these readings from Revelation. You know, as Pastor, Pastor Mark and I are kind of grabbing hold of these readings from Revelation because they give such great testimony as to Christ alive in heaven. He's there. He's here. He's omnipresent. He is everywhere. But we have an incredible scene. But isn't that just how you describe the book of Revelation? It's a bunch of incredible scenes. But I, when I look through this, actually the full reading for today is Revelation chapter 5. Verses 1 through 14. All 14 verses. What we had read was verses 8 through 14, I believe. And as we lead up to this, we have kind of a scene. It's a wonderful, great worship scene. There are are angels. There are animals as depicted in Revelation. And we have an episode here. All of the letters to the churches have been read. To the seven churches. It's all been read. And now we're ready to open the scroll. The scroll is printed on both sides, which is an indication of total completeness, the totality. But the scroll needs to be opened. Not just anyone is able or worthy to open the scroll. So, you know, there's weeping that goes on. John weeps. John is one who wrote the book of Revelation. The same one who wrote the gospel that we read earlier. The same John. It's a whole different world for him now. He is much older. He is exiled on the Alam of Patmos. Possibly the last disciple alive. The glory days are gone. Wherein he was with Jesus those three years. So I'm seeing all the miracles going all through the ups and the downs of the, of, the, of the persecution, crucifixion, and the resurrection. What an up. And now living in exile and having this incredible revelation that Jesus is giving him before his very eyes. I always say, read the first five chapters of Revelation and then skip to the back, read the last two, then back up and start back at chapter 6. Because you want to know how it turns out. Jesus wins. And God wins and God's people win. That's what you need to know. It looks like we're going to be defeated. It looks like we're going to be done in. But God wins and His people win. Through the book of Revelation. But there's the, being, the scene is being set for the revealing to come forward. The scroll symbolizes God's plan of salvation. So it's incredibly important that this be opened and revealed. It's going to be hard to open it. But there's a lion. Ah, a victorious lion, it says, as as we look into this and, and we see the lion, the scroll and the lamb. You know, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more, saying to John, Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, the conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. So I, boy, everything's looking good. We've got a lion. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. And the lion represents the tribe of Judah throughout the whole Bible. It's amazing. Things are looking up. It's going to be good. The lion is here. Ah, but wait. Wait. Yeah. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, 
I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Did you notice? There were two or three scenes of a lamb being slain in the Bible, the movie. You notice how they did it? They would hold the lamb in their arms, take a special knife, and just slit the throat. I'm being pretty depicting here. That's a slain lamb. So this lamb, the wounds of the lamb are still showing. So who would you imagine that the lamb represents? Who is this lamb? Jesus. The lamb of God. Yes. You remember I said this is a worship scene. This is an incredible worship scene. What was read earlier from the reading was the great chorus that comes forward from where we really get the, the words for this is the feast. You know, worthy is the Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be the people of God. Blessing, honor, glory, and might be to God and the what? And the Lamb forever. Amen. Amen? Right? Forever. Boy, you're quiet. Now, this is a big change from last week. <laughs> Are you with me out here? <laughs> Am I talking to you or not? Huh. So we've got a lion and we've got a lamb. And we have me. You. The me is you. Where am I in this text? I believe we're all over it. So it's not just a lion and a lamb, but I believe that we are in this text. What lessons can we learn from this text to use in our lives. Number one, God's power is displayed in weakness. That's not a new revelation, but it's a reminder of the reality. We have the verse, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. It's always the story. You notice we're using a lamb here. What? I... If I were writing this story, I think I'd be using the lion. Let's have the lion walk up and open this seal of this scroll. But no, God's way is for the lamb who would seem to be the weakest of all the animals. And it's even slain. I mean, it's a bloody mess. Why? Let's get the roaring lion up there to do this. No, we're going to use a lamb. But God's power is always demonstrated in his weakness. That's the reason, do you ever get de just feel defeated and depressed and confused over where is God in our world today? Who thought they were going to beat Muhammad Ali? George Foreman. Anybody remember the fight? I don't remember the fight, but I read good stories about it. Was it for how many rounds did Muhammad Ali stand, lean against the rope, and let George Foreman beat him to a pulp, it would seem? Till who wore out? George Foreman. And it didn't take Muhammad Ali long to stand up from the rope and take the beaten, worn out George Foreman down. One of the best fights in the world. Muhammad Ali put the champion down. He won. It looked like he was going to lose. He was being beat to a pulp, it would seem like. But he knew what he was going to do. He had the plan ready the whole time. All he needed to do was to let him wear down. And he did. Think about that. When you're, up, when you're in the ropes, you're up against the ropes. That's where the term rope-a-dope come from. That fight. Who was a dope in that? George Foreman. He was a dope. Rope-a-dope. Yeah. It looks like it's good. It's Friday. It's Friday. 
with me? The soldiers have got Jesus and they are dragging him and he's dragging his cross through the streets of Jerusalem and through the gates and out to the hill called Golgotha. Pilate has had his way. The soldiers are having their way. It's Friday, but what's coming? Sunday's coming. They're nailing Jesus to the cross. They are beating him and they are doing everything they can. They're ridiculing him. They're trading. We, we know the scene. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Google that. Google it's Friday and Sunday's coming. Semicolon Compolo. And you'll get the entire speech of Tony Compolo. And it gets right down. It's Friday. Our bank accounts are low. We're behind on our bills. Or the car won't run. Or there's something going on with our job. I just got the notice that there's no work. Don't come back. Or we get some kind of a notice. Or we get a doctor's report. That's a good Friday defeatist kind of report. It would seem like Satan is having his way. It would seem like the loss is just a matter of time. It's Good Friday, but Sunday's coming. Easter's coming. For us, Easter, Easter has come. This lamb has been slain, but he is alive and he is well, and he is the one who is worthy to give us, to open up the plan of salvation because He is the one who brings it about. He is worthy. I want to keep talking about this. God's power made perfect in our weakness. Paul has a prayer for the Ephesians. This is not in your printed outline, but it is on your PowerPoint. In Ephesians chapter 1, toward the end of that chapter, Paul indicates that I pray for you often. And he says he prays for three things. Notice these three things. I have not stopped thinking, thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to number one, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. Spiritual wisdom. I want to keep saying, if Paul prays for this, does that mean we can pray for it as, as well? It does mean that. So are you lacking wisdom? Are you lacking strength? Are you lacking hope? Are you lacking courage? We can pray for that. Do you lack wisdom in God's word? I do. But we can keep praying for it. Lord, give me your wisdom. Number two, I pray that your heart will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those He called. I think some of the translations talk about that the scales of your eyes will be removed so that you might see the hope that has been given to those He has called. His holy people who are His rich and glorious inheritance. That's you. That's me. His glorious people. This, Paul, this prayer that Paul prays applies to us. And then number three, and I want you to read this one with me. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe Him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated Him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Wow. Did you catch it? So we might think that this power that Jesus had when He rose from the dead. That's just Jesus. That's a natural way. In fact, that's the way I thought for many years. Until I came across and really got into this passage. And when you really get into this passage, you've got to go home and you've got to dig out your Bibles. If you've got it with you, do it now. I want you to circle this. You know where it says, I want you to understand this. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us 
who believe him. We can have, and what power is that? What power is he talking about? None other. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. The resurrection power is ours. Isn't that what Romans 6 is talking about? Don't you realize, Paul says, that when you were baptized, you were buried with Christ? And if you're buried with Christ, you rise with Christ, you're raised with Him, and you live in His resurrection power. But you know what I think I do with that all the time? I know it. I believe it. I want it. But do I realize it? No. Not most of the time. I forget about it. I get stuck on me. I'm stuck on me. You know? I get stuck on what Paul Short can do or can't do. I get, you know, what, what am I going to do about this? How can I handle this? And I get angry, frustrated with myself and other people around me when, I, when it's not working because it's all about me getting it together and right and all that. And who am I forgetting about? Jesus. Now, I don't know if any of you are like that. But I think it's easy for Satan to get into us and for us to just push this off or we just tuck it inside our Bibles and, oh, that's nice to know. Paul is praying that we will live with this power. When was the last time you lived with the resurrection power of Jesus in your life? In your marriage, in your home, with your children, with your parents, with your finances, all those areas of life, every, with your relationship with other people, at home, at work, on the soccer fields, the baseball fields, the bleachers, the lockers, the hallways, the classrooms, wherever it is that you are. And you need something beyond yourself. And we all need that. And we have it. Jesus wants us to take it and to use it. Number two, another part of the truth is that my strength is found in my weakness. As I come to grips with my weakness, I, I so often, what Paul learned to do was to change his prayers. <laughs> you know, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul prayed that the thorn in his flesh would be removed. Three times he prayed. God said three times, no, 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 no. So Paul began to realize when God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made what? Perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, read it with me, then I am strong. Wow. Seems like a, it's, here's this lamb and lion thing. You know, the lamb takes over. The lamb of God takes over. Third, God's weakness overcomes the world. Remember the rope dope It looked like it look it looks like Christianity is not winning out. We do live in a post-Christian society. This is not the Christian society that it was. And I want to tell you, there's a part of me that understands the largest growing group in our country when it comes to quote religion and church is the disenfranchised that are turned off at the local church. I, I long and I dream for the day when the church on earth, when the Lutheran church, when St. Andrew Lutheran church, or whatever church you're a part of, can learn to be authentic, can learn to be realistic and human, and not get so wrapped up in the religiosity of everything that we lose the reality of the authentic love of Jesus 
for this world. It is so easy for us to do that. How can we continue to reach out and to be real? How can we do that to help those? I understand the disenfranchised. I walked with them for a few years. Who needs this sometimes that the people say about the church? But God's here to overcome the world. And I believe the church should be here to help people know how we can do that. How we can over, how we can still enjoy life here in this world. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life in this world. Jesus did for 33 years. He was in it. He loved it. He soaked it up. Come on. Let's have a party. Come on. Let's have a banquet. Come on. Let's go see the people. Even in his resurrection, he's saying, bring your fish over here. Let's sit down and eat. They counted the only fish to where they count the fish. 153. Jesus was all about it. He wants his people on earth to be all about it. He wants his church to be all about it and out there with his word, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his strength, his hope. Yes, here is what is, but we need to never lose sight of what can be. What is it in your life that is dragging you down and dragging you back, holding you down, holding you back? What is it? What would be the opposite of that? What would be your dream for that? What would be your hope? Here is the way it is, but I would long for this. Jesus is saying, I'm here in that with you. We live in our Good Fridays and we keep forgetting about the Easter Sundays. It's always Good Friday. It looks like Satan is having his way in my life, in my heart, with my addiction, with this, with that. With my child, with my, with my loved ones, with my friends. Where are you, God? God is in what appears to be the defeat. God is in the ropes with us. And when we get a hold of that, we can be ready to stand up out of the ropes and to take on Satan and whatever Satan is using. I have told you these things, Jesus said, so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. If God is for us, who can be against us? So, how do we get all that to work? I mean, really. I haven't used a paper bag and balloon in a while. But I think we need to use a paper bag and balloon. So those of you that are back in Bredenburg, if you see this, yeah, I used this last week with you and I had such fun. Here's how this works. In the beginning, God made man and woman. He breathed His breath in, into them. Gave them His creative power. But as we see in chapter 3 of Genesis, men and women, what? Fell into sin. It's a hole in the bag. Now, those of you that were asleep, I hope you're awake now. So, here's how we try to live as human beings. Naturally live. Kind of what I was describing earlier. We try and grow our own life into ourselves. We try and get it together ourselves. And the harder we try, we look like trying to blow this bag up. It's got a hole in it. So does my life. So does my soul. I cannot do this myself. That's the bad news. The good news is Jesus was born. Jesus was born. He lived. He served. He suffered. He died. 
But he rose again. He came back to life. But here's how this works. Thank Pastor Eldon Weissheit for this illustration. When Jesus rose, he has us in mind. When we were baptized, we were buried with him. In that baptism, we also are raised with him. So when we live with Christ and allow Christ to be in us, here's how it works. Remember when I tried to blow air into the bag, it wouldn't work? I can blow air into this bag now, but I'm really not blowing air in the, the balloon is blowing and giving life to the bag. The bag is worthless. The bag is useless. But that which is in it, the balloon which represents Jesus in me, gives me all the worth. Now as I live, if I had it just right, I could blow this up and the paper bag would just Break all the more and you'd see more of the balloon in the bag. And wasn't it John the Baptist who said it is for me to decrease and for him to increase? So our goal in life now becomes to, as people see us, it's not, it's not us that they see, it's who. Are you out there with me? Who do they see? Jesus. I'm not sure that my life has lived enough that they will really see Jesus. Well, I can say the words, but does my life show Jesus? Lord, let me live long enough that I might do that this side of heaven more. Should be our prayer. That's what this is all about. This is, we, this is what would appear to be the defeated life. And it's Christ who gives us the victory. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Lord Jesus, thank you for such strength that you can give us. In your name we pray. Amen.